our first of the second semester of the More Art Speaker Series. And it's great through Vince and myself having a contact like BJ to come here and speak to you guys. BJ and I probably know each other a lot less than Vince and BJ do, but we actually work together. Uh, I write for Sports Illustrated on the NFL side, and of course he runs the college side. So I think you're going to learn a lot here. You're going to see a lot of overlap and in interactions between the journalism side, the legal side, the business side, and of course the exploding business of college sports, both from a journalistic angle, legal angle, and business angle, which you've seen on the board <laughs> earlier this class. Okay, so what I, what I just want to start with some questions for him, but as he said, let's make it really interactive. It's a good group here. I know you all can talk. I've seen it. So we'll have you talk as well. Uh, why don't you just go through your background? I think everybody's interested in sort of how you got to where you are at SI yeah. and kind of inflection points <coughs> in your career going, going from school all the way to now. Yeah, well, like many people involved in sports, um, <clears throat> you know, I've been an athlete all my life. Um, you know, I think, you know, sports from a very young age really shaped who I am um, from, you know, the work ethic. You know, I learned from uh, a coach very early on that, you know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. It's a motto I use and consider every single day. You know, you think about it and there's always somebody that's going to be smarter than you. There's always somebody gonna, that's going to be more talented than you are, but there doesn't have to be somebody that works harder. That's the one variable that you can always control. If you work hard at something, you will find success. I can't tell you when you're going to find success, but you will find success. I learned that through sports, and it's carried me throughout my whole career, and it's something that I've never forgotten. Um, when, you know, when I was growing up as an athlete, I learned not only hard work, but to be competitive. And I carry that through me every day. You know, whether you're, you're working on a story or you're, you know, you're trying to get to a, a subject, get somebody to talk to you, um, you know, you're trying to figure out a problem. Um, I'm as competitive as they come, and I want to get it. I want to get the story. I want people to be able to, to trust me. I want to succeed. Um, I want to beat you, 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 and you, and, and you know, I can do that the right way um, you know, without compromising um, you know, myself. So I think work ethic and competitiveness started at a very early age. Um, you know, I, I quickly realized you know, I was a three-sport athlete, uh, you know, basketball, baseball, soccer, um, and played through high school, and I, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't going pro. Uh, and anything as hard as I worked, and, and sometimes you have to be realistic. Um, so uh, I ended up getting hurt um, my sophomore year in high school, and I couldn't play basketball. I, I got hurt in soccer season, and I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't play that winter. But I still was involved with the team, you know, kind of sitting on the bench, and I got involved with calling in scores in my local newspaper, and and I started to see, man, like this was, you know, this is an avenue. Um, I grew up in the Boston area. The Boston Globe at the time was the best sports section in the country. I grew up reading it, the likes of Lee Montville and Dan Shaughnessy and Jackie McMullen and the late Will McDonough, just talent upon talent upon talent. And, um, you know, Andrew will know this the, from the NFL side. Will was really one of the first uh, writers to get on television regularly, national television. Bud Collins, who was also a Globe writer, did it in tennis and um, you know, he was, you know, the flamboyant analyst on uh, Wimbledon coverage and all the majors. But Will really was the one, and he did it for NBC, you know, he, he really went from the newsroom to the studio. And uh, really paved the way for a lot of people, um, to, you know, after him uh, to do it. Um, the most prominent, uh, which is, you know, could be, you know, Peter King, who um, runs the MMQB. And, uh, but there are scores of journalists. You look at ESPN, you look at Adam Schefter. Former newspaper writer, you know, covered the Broncos for the Denver Post, worked at a lot of smaller different newspapers. It's become a path for everybody else. So I, you know, I saw that um, that could be a path for me and um, was also very interested in television. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to, to really be the, the person with the information. You know, I wanted not just to be a talking head, uh, reading off a teleprompter or, you know, as we see now with a lot of the stuff that goes on at ESPN and in Sports Talk Radio, the shouters, um, most of those people don't know anything. Um, but, 
uh, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, he who shouts or she who shouts the shoutest, uh, the loudest wins, um, you know, at least in that form. I never wanted to be that. So I went on the writing route. Uh, I was very fortunate, um, you know, I went to school in Boston at Northeastern University. It's a five-year program, has a co-op program. They had an in the Boston Globe. And uh, that was heaven, you know, for me because, again, going back to work ethic, um, you know, opening that door, no, nothing was ever given to me, um, even to this day. I work for everything I've ever gotten. And, you know, my attitude is open that door and I'm going to break it straight through. And so I started off at the Boston Globe. I was 19 years old. Um, I had written for my local newspaper when I was in high school, uh, but the Globe is obviously, um, you know, this is, this is the big leagues. Um, and I started, my first shift was in the summer of 1992. Uh, I was working from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m., answering phones, taking racing scores. Most of you probably don't know what agate is. Does anybody know what agate is? If, you, if anybody still reads the newspaper, if you look at the, you know, the standings, the scores, the racing results, that's the transactions, yeah, that's called agate. So before everything, everybody just kind of emailed it in or put it on you know, a website where everybody could access it, people would call it in. And so I was with my little notepad, you know, writing it down and giving it to people at the desk. And I started there. And then I parlayed that into writing assignments. And um, you know, I covered high school sports there for five years. And um, a lot of people now, I speak to journalists all the time, and, and you know, young journalists, undergrads, you know, grad students, and a lot of people look down on covering high school sports. It was one of the best experiences of my life because, one, the access was great. The stories were great. People were eager to talk to you. And you had to find everything yourself. There's no PR people, sports information people. There's no, you know, there was no internet. Um, you know, nobody's giving you these stories. You have to find. Them. I covered a high school football game, you know, and it's three degrees out, and my pen is freezing. Um, I got to figure out how to keep my own stats. Um, I got to chase the, the winning coach as he's running for his bus. Um, I got to figure out how to file my story when I have 15 minutes until my deadline. All these things, you know helped shape me, and, and so that was some of the best experiences of, of my life. I thought I was going to go to ESPN like everybody else. ESPN was starting to get big, um, and uh, I thought, you know, I was, I'm going you know, to be the next Dan Patrick or you know, so forth. But um, I really liked uh, writing, and um, as it turned out, um, I started doing news stories. You know, I started working hard, and athletes get in trouble. You know, uh, we see that every single day. So I got the opportunity to work with some of the top news editors at the Globe. Um, you know, when one top basketball player in the area, a guy by the name of Jamal Jackson, who was, um, you know, uh, he was a star at Cleveland State at the time, he got stabbed. You know, one summer night. And so I used to cover him when he was in high school. So I wrote the A1 story. Um, when I also worked with the Northeastern basketball team, um, and when Reggie Lewis died, you know, he just dropped dead. He was at Brandeis University. He was playing with four of my teammates. So I, along with 27 other reporters from the Globe and about 500 other reporters from the Boston area, was dispatched, and it was get the story. And so I worked, you know, 16 hours that day, and I had bylines and taglines all over the paper uh, because I was resourceful and knew how to go, uh, knew who to go to. Um, unbeknownst to me, um, there was somebody from afar that had been watching me, and you never know, uh, you never know who's looking at you, especially today with social media and everything. But the editor at Sports Illustrated at the time, legendary guy, his name is a guy by the name of Mark Molvoy. And he was from Boston. Um, he was what we call the double eagle. You know, he uh, went to BC High uh, and Boston College. And uh, he worked at the Globe, much like me. And, and I saw that he rose, you know, to the ranks of, uh, at Sports Illustrated and to the, one of the highest posts in journalism. His brother, Tom Movoy, was a top editor on the news side at the Globe. So one day, you know, in my senior year, I approached Tom and I said, hey, do you think you know, your brother would be open to me visiting him in New York one day or uh, talking to him on the phone? I would just like to pick his brain. And he said, uh, he said you know what? As a matter of fact, uh, my brother has been reading you for four years. He sees a lot of himself in you. And he's very interested. And he said, if you ever asked that here's the, here's the, here's the chief of reporters at Sports Illustrated, I think you'd be perfect for a job here. 
I never would have known that if I hadn't asked. Again, like nothing is handed to you. Um, even though that connection exists, existed, both Tom and his brother wanted to see if I had the initiative to ask. And sometimes all it is is asking. If, you know, if pe people call me up and ask me all the time, I'm happy to talk to them. You know, a lot of times it's just taking the initiative and asking. Um, so I was offered a job in 1996 at Sports Illustrated. Again, you got, you're, you're, you, I was hired as a six-month project employee. My parents said, don't take this. They were both from New York. They're, you're going to be out on the street. You're not going to make enough money. What are you doing? Um, New York's going to eat you up and spit you out. And I said, no, this is an opportunity for me to open the, the doors open this much. I'm going to bust it open. And so that was kind of my attitude. You know, when, when I got to Sports Illustrated, I said, all right, I never realized that this was a possible path for me, but now I'm here, I'm going to find 25 other young people like me. Um, there weren't 25 other people like me. There were maybe two or three. All the other ones went to Princeton and Harvard and Yale. Um, they got there by, a lot of, by connections, by other means. And it took me a good six months to a year to come to terms with that to say, like, look, you know, this is fair. Well, you know what? This is life. This is what you're up against. Um, you know, many of you that if you, you know, stay on the law path, you, you know, you want to go to a top firm, yeah, they're going to they're gonna recruit from Harvard, Penn, yeah, that's just the way it is. But my attitude was, give me a chance, and I'm going to blow by these people. So a lot of those people are either out of the industry, or you know what, they work for me. And, you know, that's just, again, it's just, it's, it's taking advantage of your opportunity. And um, so I've constantly looked for opportunities to you know do things whether they're big projects you know I did a I, I did a package that we partnered with uh, CBS News on crime and college football where we did criminal background checks on every single player on all the top 25 teams over 2800 background checks in all huge ambitious project people told us we couldn't do it um, you know I'd be I partnered like I said with CBS News got to become good friends with Armin Katayan, who was the chief investigative correspondent at, uh, 60, at, at CBS News at the time. He's now with 60 Minutes, um, you know, and is really a titan in our industry. He's now one of my close personal friends. Um, so you never know where that opportunity, there was an opportunity to, uh, you know, Peter uh, King launched the MMQB three years ago. Andrew writes for it. I saw an opportunity in college sports to do a vertical like that to tell these great stories. And in college sports, there, there are great stories everywhere. There are traditions. There are, the passion runs so deep. And in the NFL, you got 32 teams. And, uh, you know, in college, you know, you have, um, you have 64 Power 5 teams, but, you know, you have 128 schools in, in major Division I college football. In basketball, it's, you know, it's over 330. So there are endless stories out there. You just got to find them. Um, so that's what that's my you know latest challenge with uh, you know with this website Campus Rush, which in six months is it's grown um, much further than I ever could have imagined. Um, but I just told my team this uh, last year. I'd like to say that we're just scratching the surface with what we can do, but we're not we're not even at the surface yet. Um, so it's you know I've always kind of been um, a big thinker and um, and looking for. Uh, you know, whether it's the next big story, uh, the next big thing, and now it's how can we deliver media stories to all of you, you know, and get you to read them, you know? Like, we've come to, you know, we've come to a place now, and I'll get on my soapbox for two seconds, and I promise I'll get right off of it. Everyone with one of these, every person with one of these thinks that they're a journalist. And we have these TMZs of the world. You know, it just came out that you know TMZ paid over hundred thousand dollars for the Ray Rice tape. We all knew that, um, but you know that's something that's very real and we can compete with. Uh, you know, I go to focus groups and talk to students all the time, and and people troll Twitter and you know the Peter Kings or the Andrew Brants and the Tom Verducci's of the world. People that have paid their dues and spent decades in this business. Most people don't. They don't care, you know. It's it's a reason why Bleacher Report became so successful, because whereas a place like Sports Illustrated um, concentrated on the content first, which from a practical standpoint makes sense, what Bleacher did, and in hindsight was very smart. They concentrated on technology first. 
They found a way to deliver it to all of you, whether it's with TeamStream, with push alerts, and they do it better than anybody out there. Um, so now they're coming to the second phase and improving their content. And you know what? Most people, you know, there's a lot of garbage out there in terms of content. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't care. So our aim is to deliver great content or to create great content and figure out how to deliver it. Can I ask a little more about the campus rush? So mm -hmm. business decision, you see a vertical opportunity. Do you assess the market? What's out there with Yahoo? What's with ESPN? What's with Bleacher Report? Where are these things going? Do you look at budgeting? I mean, does that just come to you while you're sitting on the, on the bus or train one day? How does that start? Yeah, I mean, I've had this idea for three or four years. Um, and it's, I think it's all of those things. It's, um, you know, the, the phrase in our industry that I'm trying to outlaw um, is, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's like, it's like a, you know, a curse word to me or a phrase is built if sold. And we hear that all the time, where if we can get an advertiser behind it, um, and then you can build it. Well, I mean, if you, th you think about it, that's kind of backwards. You know, you, you, know, you want to create something, you, know, you should have the concept locked down first, and then you should bring it to market. A lot of times we do things the opposite way. Um, so my, you know, my thinking was, like, why can't we do both? Why can't we sell a great idea? So the idea itself was uh, conceived well before uh, last summer um, when we decided to launch it. Um, a big part of it was Campus Rush has a campus correspondence program where we have student reporters at every major football school in the country. Now that we've expanded to basketball, um, we have them at a lot of the basketball schools. In fact, we have a campus correspondent here at Villanova um, who does a good job for us covering the basketball program. Uh, you know, we have one at Georgetown, we have one at Gonzaga, Wichita State, you know, those schools. Um, so a campus correspondent program is something well before I had the idea of Campus Rush. How can we get the pulse of college sports because really college sports is so provincial is so regional um, is so kind of dedicated to the individual schools themselves how can we get our hands on the pulse and th a lot of that is through the correspondence and um, i want i just wanted to get you know fresh ideas and fresh blood into sports illustrated then when we kind of married the kind of campus correspondence um, idea with college sports starting with football, you know, what's bigger than football? Uh, nothing right now. Um, you know, it, it was kind of the perfect storm. And then, you know, then, you know, I sold it hard. You know, there's, um, it used to be, you, you might have heard the, um, the term, the wall between church and state. Um, that means business and, business and editorial. Um, there used to be a huge wall that you didn't cross. Ideas did not come from the business side. Uh, the business side had no input on editorial. There wasn't much communication or collaboration. Um, several years ago, that wall came tumbling down. It had to. We, we need each other to survive. You know, we want to create great content, but we need money to do it. We need to be a profitable business. And how do we do that? We need to do that together. Um, so over the last three or four years, I worked very closely with our business side to try to sell stuff. Um, and what we found with whether it's ad agencies or advertisers themselves, you know, they're, they're so sick of healing, hearing from salespeople. They, you know, it's not authentic. You know, they don't believe in, the, in their content. I've learned a long time ago that if you don't do something with passion, then don't do it. Um, you know, you, you, you don't do anything halfway. And so when I was able to get in front of a few potential advertisers and a few people that uh, pass for whatever reason, some of it budgetary, um, you know, it was my job to sell it. You know, to say, look, you know, I want a million dollars for you guys, and here's why. And I, right before I came here, I just had a call with Finish Line. Uh, Finish Line was one of our launch sponsors, and they took a leap of faith. And um, they were rewarded because, you know, we've grown leaps and bounds, but they didn't know. Um, and I talked to the chief marketing officer, and we were, I was able to start um, a scholarship program for our campus correspondents. We're going to announce soon that we have three scholarships, three $5,000 scholarships to our top performing uh, correspondents. And it's a great story, and they're really excited about it. And it's all because um, they took a leap of faith on us that we would find these people, we would create this compelling content. And um, yes, a lot of it was selling on my part, but I believed in it. 
Um, and I was going to make sure, and I told the chief marketing officer at Finish Line, I said, if you take a leap of faith, if you believe in me, that I promise that you will be rewarded. You know, you, I will create something that it may not, you know, it may not have, you know, 10 million unique visitors a month, although I think it eventually could, but it's something that you can be proud of and you can go to your CEO, you can go to your sales meetings, you can go to your individual, your 380 locations across the country and be proud of it. And so, um, you know, integrity about your product, and this goes, this doesn't just go for journalism, um, it goes for anything you create. If you guys are representing someone, um, you know, in a case, um, you might be able to win the case by, you know, embarrassing somebody or producing all the sleazy ev evidence, but, um, you know, is that, is that exhibiting integrity? I don't know, it's up to you to decide. For me, it's not worth it, you know. Case in point, I knew that if we put pictures of half-naked co-eds on Campus Rush, our traffic would go like this. And it was suggested to me that we try to do that. And we do it, to be fair, at other places in Sports Illustrated. The swimsuit issue just came out. It's a hugely successful franchise. It's probably 30% of our revenue. Um, we have another franchise called Extra Mustard, and in it is Hot Clicks. Hot Clicks every day outdraws Peter King because we have a lovely lady of the day, we have, um, you know, we have pictures of some half-naked women, and a lot of people like that. Um, but for me, you know, to create this product, I'm not gonna go there. And if I was forced to go there, I would not be a part of that product, because to me, that's putting the focus here where should, it should be the focus here. Now, we all have to play the game a little bit, the traffic game and you know aggregating and doing you know producing viral videos you know all you guys you know I'm sure you're on your phones and somebody tweets or snaps a, a video of something and you know that that's a good diversion from your day for two minutes great yeah and you know I'm more than happy to spread those around but what's going to be the core of our product you know, it's going to be our journalism. It's going to be our unique storytelling. It's going to be giving you a vantage point that nobody else is. You know, what Campus Rush is all about is not the games themselves. You know, if you want news, if you want instant analysis, if you want scores, you can go to SI.com, you can go to ESPN, you can go to Bleacher, you can go somewhere else. But we're built on the pillar of you come to our site and you read what we have you're going to find something that doesn't exist anywhere. You know, you're going to be engaged. You're going to be inspired. That's what we're trying to do, and that's something that did not exist in the market in the college sports realm. I'll ask one more, then I'll open it up. The story you mentioned with Armin, the CBS report, mm -hmm. we obviously are very proud of that. I met you when you were just done the Oklahoma State investigation. Yeah. So maybe name, if it's that, your most proud moments, the stories that you are most proud of over the years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the crime in college football story where um, we, you know, we, we did something that nobody had ever done, and um, we, we, we had 2,800 background checks on players. We had all of um, this information we went to, um, you know, we checked records in 25 different states. We went to you know five different agencies and threw out it all you know threw out all those record checks and and um, you know probably four thousand words in Sports Illustrated another five thousand online and SI.com a piece on um, the CBS Evening News and a piece on the Early Show we didn't make one mistake not one error and one error can undermine your uh, your whole credibility and so I was extremely proud of that um, the Oklahoma State story you mentioned. I'm proud of it, but it was such a learning experience. Uh, three years ago, we did a five-part series into corruption in Oklahoma State football. And we had, um, we had 65 former players on the record on tape telling us everything that happened. Um, and the five parts were, were money, uh, players being paid in various ways, whether it's a pay-for-play system, uh, whether it's no-show or sham jobs, or whether it's a booster just giving them money. Um, you know, so that was, uh, that was part one. Academics were, uh, was part two. Uh, players were taking sham classes. There were passing classes that they didn't deserve um, to pass. People writing papers for them. We saw all this at North Carolina. We saw it at Minnesota many years ago. We've seen this before. Um, drugs was part four. 
um, on how not only players on the Oklahoma State football program were using drugs, they had um, their assistant strength coach was in charge of the drug program for the Oklahoma State football program and had no experience. He lied about having a master's degree on his resume. And I'll never forget this. We're sitting you know, in an open conference room and um, we're asking him about his background. He said, yeah, no, I never got my master's. Well, you put it on your resume. And then the AD is sitting right here. And I said, well, did you check his reference? And he said to me, I didn't even look at his resume. I said, OK, thank you. Um, so that was uh, you know, drugs. That was, that was part, uh, part three. Part four was, was sex, um, which you know, a lot of people were very interested in. Uh, like many uh, athletic programs, um, there's a story, uh, or there's a, there's a group named Orange Pride. There are hostess groups that, um, that just kind of show the recruits around. Um, it, uh, it, it kind of more than tripled from 13 members under Bob Sibbins to 50, 50 plus under Les Miles when he was a coach at Oklahoma State. Um, and then the fifth part was the fallout. What happens to these players when they're not as good as you think they are, or they get into trouble, or they don't go to class, or they get hurt? What happens to all these players that recruit? Uh, a lot of them you know, under bad family situations, um, some of them from very poor neighborhoods and uh, rural situations um, in some cases. What happens to them? Well, they're they're thrown away like trash. Um, and that was really, that was the point of the whole series. We see corruption, you know, we see cheating in college sports all the time. Um, this was unique to me because we had every single way you could cheat, whether it's academics, whether it's drugs, you know, whether it's sex, what, you know, whether it's money, in one place, which we hadn't seen before. And it coincided just coincidentally with Oklahoma State being two and 10 um, to Oklahoma State winning the Fiesta Bowl. So that was interesting to me, plus we had everybody on the record. Um, but I learned a lot from that, and I think I'm proud of our reporting, but um, we made some mistakes. We made a factual error. We, said, we, we, we claimed one player got his degree. He never got his degree. That was easy for us to check. We screwed it up. You know, It was inserted at the last minute um, as we were closing a story. There's no excuse for it. We screwed up, we got egg on our face, and it hurt the whole package. Um, so no matter what you do, you know, if you're in a case and you present something in open court, it's, it's wrong. That's going to hurt your case because somebody's going to expose that or a judge is going to figure out it's wrong or a jury, and that's going to uh, undermine your entire case and the integrity of what you're trying to present. So um, I learned a lot from that. I also learned that I wouldn't do a five-part series in this day and age. Um, it's too much. You know, it's really too much. Um, people were just, I would, I would say people were, would be waiting every single day to see what we have next. And they were. But they were there with, you know, with slings and arrows ready to, you know, attack us. And a lot of that came from, you know, you, you attack a big institution or a university like Oklahoma State and they're going to come after you with everything you have. And that's fine. But just be prepared for that. I don't think we were uh, prepared for that. The, the last thing I learned was... Um, that we should have done the last part first. That was the point, you know, and that by the time part five came out, everybody was so tired of what we had and we had taken so many hits, fairly or unfairly, but that was the point, you know, it was the human side. And so no matter what you do, like to really get somebody to, whether you want them to see what you're trying to present um, or understand the kind of point of your story, your research, you know, it's to present the human side, and I thought, you know, this would be a great capper to end with, whereas we should have led with it. You know, you always want to lead with your best stuff. That was our best stuff, and we were kind of holding it to the very end. That was a mistake. Um, the one story, the last story I'll, I'll say that, um, that I've never forgotten and I've, I've um, carried with me my whole career, it happened when I was a young journalist. I was probably 21, 22. I was at the Boston Globe, was covering high school sports. Um, there was a, the top player in the state at the time was a guy by the name of Chris Heron. He went on to Boston College, Fresno State under Jerry Tarkanian. Um, he went, he was drafted in the second round by the Denver Nuggets, ended up getting traded by the, to the Celtics, which is a huge mistake. 
um, played overseas, you know, was strung up on drugs, nearly died twice. Um, you might see him on Twitter or on social media now. He's now a speaker. He's, he speaks very well to pro in college and high school, uh, junior high, and he's it's incredibly powerful. He finally got his life together. But Heron was the top player in the state, and he, um, you know, everybody wanted to know where he was going to go. He was going to announce the, ne the next day. My boss came to me and said, find out where he's going. And I had a good relationship with Heron. You know, every time he'd get in trouble, get suspended in school, which happened often, I'd call him up and I'd say, Chris, what happened? He's like, oh man, you know, this guy, you know, he, he disrespected me and my family. I'm like, you gotta walk away, man. And he would tell me the whole story. So I tried, you know, I knew he had just gone up to Syracuse to, to visit Jim Beheim um, in the Orange and uh, really liked it. Um, and so I called, you know, I, I knew his parents. I called his parents. This was before everybody had cell phones. <laughs> I called his parents, um, nobody was home, left a message on the machine. I called his brother, who was a former, uh, he went to Durfee High, a former Durfee star, no answer. Um, I kept calling, calling, calling. Finally, I got his AAU coach, a guy by the name of Leo Papil, who uh, used to be uh, a scout in the front office of uh, the Celtics, um, very powerful guy in the AAU world. And he told me, he said, I can't tell you where he's going, but um, I'm just going to say it's a big blow to Eagles fans. In Boston College, of course, the Eagles. And I said, are you telling me he's going to Syracuse? And he said, it's a big blow to Eagles fans. Figure it out yourself. And I said, OK. So I write my story, and I said, a source close to Heron said he's leaning towards Syracuse. Um, and I wrote the whole thing. He just made the trip, whatever. Left the office. I saw the first, you know, this is, papers have different editions. Most papers have one edition now. But the Globe had four editions. And Durfee, in, which is in Fall River, which is just about on Cape Cod, gets the first edition of the paper. Um, so the, the headline said, Heron to choose Syracuse, question mark, and it was written just as I uh, described. I come into the paper the next day, and I see it's changed. The question mark is off the headline. The, story, the lead of the story, the first graph, is rewritten, saying Heron is going to Syracuse. Well, no sooner did I get into the paper, you know, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, the, uh, the phone started ringing off the hook at Boston College. And Will McDonough, who um, was one of my mentors, was probably the most plugged in person, not just sports person, but person in Boston. This is a guy who grew up with Whitey Bulger and, believe me, knew where the bodies were buried. Um, so Will comes up to me and he puts his arm around me as a kid. I think he got this one wrong. And I was like, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? And so even though, um, and we come to find you know, throughout the course of the day that he was going to BC. And so I got the story wrong. And I remember, I'll never forget this, Jack McMullen pulled me aside and said, look, we all make mistakes. We never forget it. Just don't make it again. You, know, you were batting 1,000 before this. Now you're batting 900. I appreciate it in hindsight. Didn't make me feel any better. Um, I went to the press conference. They had it in his, uh, you know, his, his uh, junior high gym where he first started playing basketball, Heron. And so nobody knew. I was like a 21-year-old kid reporter from the Globe. Nobody knew who I was. But I go up there, and I'm sitting there, and everybody's whispering about how the story's wrong in the Globe. Um, you know, I'm hearing Dewey defeats Truman. Um, I'm hearing all this, all this stuff. And so, I mean, I felt this big. And, um, but I went down with the t my tail between my legs, and, and I see uh, his high school basketball coach, his name is Skip Karam, and he looks at me and he goes, what happened? Why'd you do that? I would have told you. And I said, Skip, I, I was calling you all night. Then his brother, Mike Karam, comes up to me, and he's like shaking his head. He's like, come on, man, you know, you could have called me. And I'm like, I did call you. And then I saw Chris, and you know, Chris was a seven-year-old kid, he didn't care. Um, so I wrote my story, it was on page one of the Globe, um, I filed it, I still felt horrible. Um, then I, I turn on the local news and the local anchors, this, this woman, um, you know, it was, it was Chet and Natalie, Natalie Goldcheck. And um, she was comment. she didn't know anything about sports, she was commenting to the story, she's like, didn't the Globe get that wrong today? How could they do that? So I'm literally throwing my shoe at the TV. So I felt, you know, I felt awful, but it taught me a lot of things. Um, it taught me, like, it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm a 21-year-old kid um, or, you know, I'm 20 years in the business. It's my name, you know, and you have to fight for that story. If you're not 100% sure, 
then make, make sure you make that known. You know, I've always, you know, we've seen this, you know, with whether it's a breaking news story or with Penn State, um, you know, with somebody reporting that Joe Paterno was actually a student newspaper, had died on a Saturday night when he really didn't. And CBS Sports Network ended up, or CBSSports.com ended up running with it, and they were wrong. Um, you know, it's always better to be second and right than first and wrong, always. And you have to, you know, you have to be your own advocate because now, especially now, you know, you're only as good as your name. We're all our own brands, you know, no matter what you do, you know, no matter what organization. Yes, you're representing that organization, but you make a mistake like that, that's going to carry with you. So I never made that mistake again. And as a postscript to the story, about three years ago, um, Heron co-wrote a book with a local journalist called Basketball Junkie. And in the book, he, um, he wrote that when he went to bed, he you know, told his family that he picked Syracuse. And when, we, when he woke up, he changed his mind. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I saw Heron um, in New York City um, shortly after the book came out. And, uh, and you know, we kind of caught up, and he remembered who I was. And I said, I got to ask you about that story. Is that really true? And he said, yeah, it is. Damn, I feel this much better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think college, it's a good question. I think college sports is changing. You know, I think what, the, what Missouri did, in my view, and not everybody agrees with this, is a little opportunistic. You know, if they were, you know, if they were 10 and 1, you know, and they were headed to the SEC championship game, would they have walked out? I'm not so sure. Um, you know, I think uh, two years prior to this incident, there was an incident at Grambling. Um, when you know it was deplorable conditions and um, equipment that was you know corrosive and not up to uh, standards that you know the Grambling um, football team walked out. Um, I think college athletes hold tremendous power, um, and something absolutely has to be done uh, in in college sports. Um, you know, as you know what the Northwestern case showed is like, yeah, they really are employees of the school. Now, will that go anywhere? I don't think that will go anywhere, but in my view, a college athlete in season, representing the school, traveling, um, you know, at this high level, dedicating so many hours to his or her sport, that should be that person's work study or internship. They should get credit for that. Should they get paid? College athletes will never get paid. It just, it, it just won't happen for a couple of reasons. One, universities have tax-exempt status. And if they have um, you know, a for-profit athletic department, they're going to lose that. Um, the other, even though, as you, saw, as you see from the, the chart behind me, um, athletic departments make a lot of money. Um, the second hurdle is, is Title IX. And you know, I'm sure you guys have all studied and read Title IX, but if you pay a football player, just say $25,000 a year, you've got to make sure that every other female athlete at that university gets paid the same amount. It's not sustainable. Um, so I think whereas college athletes still hold a lot of power, um, nobody has really figured out how to harness that. Because you think about, you know, because of the one and done rule, because, um, you know, since Maurice Claret challenged the NFL rule where you have to be three years removed from high school to be eligible to enter the NFL, nobody has successfully challenged that. A college athlete or a high school athlete going to college needs that school as much as the school needs them. Um, so until we kind of fix the, you know, the system, and maybe it's that, Anybody that, um, that wants to go into the NFL or the NBA should be allowed, you know, and, and there's been plenty of arguments in support of that. Um, 
But you know, I, I think no, you know, college athletes, while they hold power, they haven't figured out how to harness that power in the right direction. A lot of people think you know, that there should be some sort of college sports union. Um, and there's, there's a lot of merit you know, to that you know, for, you know, for benefits. You know, for, you know, we see uh, college athletes, um, especially ones that are potential first round picks, taking out these huge insurance policies and NCAA rules have changed that allow schools to pay towards that premium and allow athletes that are projected in the first half of the first round to defer many of those payments, which can be tens of thousands of dollars um, until, uh, until later. Um, so I think there's a lot swirling out there and there's a lot of noise between the O'Bannon case, between the Northwestern case, um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Kessler has a, another big uh, case challenging the foundation of college sports. There's a lot brewing, um, but until we can kind of get together and figure out this is what we need to do and this is where it needs to go, because as of right now, the rich are getting richer. You know, the Alabamas, the Oregons, uh, you know, the Ohio States, the Texases, they're making money hand over fist. Um, and some of, the, some of the other schools, whether it's you know, Mississippi State or Iowa State or other schools in the Power Five, they're losing money. You know, uh, if you research athletic departments, um, most, most schools, the majority, I think all except 10 or 12 schools, lose money on football, and a lot of athletic departments are in the red. Um, so we have a multi-billion dollar business um, where the select few, less than the 1%, are getting rich. Um, we got to take that money and we got to take that goodwill and we got to figure out how to use it. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of a, a catch-22 because, um, you know, these schools pay these coaches millions and millions of dollars. Um, most football and basketball coaches are the highest paid employees in, in their states. Certainly, Tennessee is a, a good example. I think that, you know, with Tennessee, I don't see that happening uh, very often because most coaches don't want to put themselves in the line of fire. Um, with a situation like Tennessee where you have an athletic department uh, that has such major problems and over years and years and years and years where this has continued to kind of spiral out of control, I think you can get away with that. But most coaches, just like a lot of athletes, don't like to um, you know, speak out on, on, uh, on issues. You know, we don't see many athletes doing that. Uh, I don't see a lot of coaches doing that you know, for, their reason, for that reason. They don't want to they don't want to take a stand. They don't want to threaten, you know, their 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 money. Um, a lot of uh, you know, a lot of these schools, especially these athletic departments, are extremely powerful. I think what you're seeing at Tennessee is, you know, people that are connected to the, this athletic department want to separate themselves a little bit. And I think you're seeing that coaches, uh, these coaches, doing that. But I don't see that as a trend. My two cents on the, the unfortunate part of Tennessee is you have this lawsuit, Title IX lawsuit by six women of a sexually hostile environment. <clears throat> but the focus from our point of view, media, is on Peyton Manning. And this whole Peyton Manning shift of focus has really taken away from the case. Mm -hmm. And it's very unfortunate because yeah. obviously he's going to be drawing all the attention. Stories that are 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes they do. In a lot of cases, they do. Uh, a lot of programs won't let uh, the media talk to freshmen. And some of that, you know, I understand is valid. Um, yeah, generally when there's, when there's something, there becomes a wall. I mean, major football and basketball programs are, you know, are, are, are closed doors to begin with. It's, it's kind of hard to crack that code, especially football. Um, you know, college coaches, you know, run that, um, you know, like they're running the Kremlin. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really pretty uh, insane. But, you know, there's so many different ways of, of finding out information. The whole point of this crime in college football story that we did was not to wag our finger and saying, if athletes got in trouble while they're in high school, they shouldn't get a scholarship. No, everybody deserves second chances. And we, we presented a case of a, of a kid that went to the University of Wisconsin, uh, was in Florida, and you know, you guys are all studying law, so if you have to get open records uh, anywhere in the country, Florida, best, best place in the, in, the, in the country. They have the, those sunshine records laws are great. You know, for $26, we go online, we didn't even, we, we just needed a name and a date of birth. I can find a Trevor, tr treasure trove of records, including juvenile records, mm -hmm. which is how we found this one case. But Wisconsin, unlike most programs, Wisconsin, this kid was charged with a, an armed robbery, a home invasion. Um, there was a 17-year-old girl who was home from school, locked herself in the bathroom. I heard the 911 tape. It was awful. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but it, was, um, it wasn't a nonviolent crime. He ended up going to uh, being sentenced as a juvenile to juvie on the weekends, um, and he was released during the week to go to school. Um, Wisconsin knew about it and put very specific measures in place um, higher standards that he would have to adhere to um, than any other student athlete, he ended up getting on the straight and narrow and, and ended up not having a problem there. And that was kind of our point, but out of the 25 schools that we, um, that, that we investigated, 23 of them didn't do any sort of background check, cursory background check on any of the recruits they were bringing in. And so with me, a team of six, you know, we did all 25 teams, <coughs> Um, and we didn't have nearly the budgets that they do, so a lot of times they don't know what they're getting, and if they do, they turn a blind eye. I mean, we're seeing there's a case, uh, you know, at the, just this week we found out at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma on their football program, there, um, there's a, a running back named Joe Mixon. Um, he's, you know, one of the top running backs on the team. Well, he was suspended for a year. Two years ago, um, he punched a woman with an open fist in a bar, and there's video of it. And the Oklahoma court sealed that video and wouldn't release it. Well, we found out this week they're going to release it. So it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen with, uh, with Joe Mixon. But we see whether it's the courts, whether it's the university putting pressure uh, on. A lot, of these ad a lot of these athletes are just coddled. Um, but we as media, even though we may not be able to get to that person, well, I can talk to his family. I can talk to his friends. I can do record searches. I can find out who that this person is. And a lot of times, like the write around, the story um, you know, becomes a much richer story when you don't actually get access to the subject. We call that a write around. And um, ideally, you want to give everybody their voice. But a lot of times, it forces you to look in places you wouldn't think of looking if you know, we're sitting right here and I can, you know, I can talk to somebody and ask them what happened on that day and have they ever gotten in trouble before. And, you know, kind of what their behavior and mindset has been like. Yes, up top. Mm -hmm. 
I would say take advantage of your opportunities and the peop the audience of people that you know you 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 get you get introduced to as an athlete you know especially a successful one a college level athlete you're going to meet all sorts of people through all walks of life you know I've been in sports you know my whole life but I I'm a journalist I'm not necessarily a sports writer I could leave sports tomorrow but I've met and networked and met so many great people you know for example I'll give you one example um, I have uh, I've been on all sorts of panels and a, a few years ago I was on a panel at the Rothman Institute um, on you know just like medicine and sports and whatever and I met a whole bunch of doctors at the Rothman Institute and I said you know why don't we do something together and through that you know I, I ended up at Rothman headquarters and uh, met Dr. Rothman himself Dr. you know Dick Rothman who has just got a tremendous story and you know like that we just we clicked we became you know we became friends and and um, you know that's just you know a connect and I met a whole bunch of other doctors associated with his practice um, you know I think through sports so many people are interested in sports and my job people are like, oh you work for a sport you go to a party you work for a sports Illustrated. Oh, tell me about the fantasy your fantasy team I don't want to talk about fantasy uh, I don't want to talk about anybody that but people you know, people want to talk to me because I'm associated with a high-level sports um, organization and you know I've you know met all these different athletes and different people they like to hear that well I can use that as a door an open door to talk about something else and to develop a connection and so you know I think sports is so unique that you know everybody knows somebody that's played sports everybody kinda has an appreciation and an affinity of sports played at the highest level played right because it can be so graceful and so beautiful when played right so if you have that ability you are automatically creating all these opportunities now most athletes or most people that get involved in that don't take advantage of that whether it's a, a booster that says you know that's running a multi-million dollar business well maybe you get an internship in that business you know maybe this person's gonna take a liking you know to your son and saying you know he's a really good kid he's got a great head on his shoulders really intelligent I really think he can go somewhere and that person wouldn't have met him had it not been for sports so you know and I think that it, this applies to anything in life but sports in particular to answer your question I think there's so many doors that can open and you just have to look for them everything is an opportunity every place that I go every event that I go to whether it's to cover or um, every panel that I'm on is a person that I can meet and um, it's just you know it's a connection and they could be a friend they could be a business contact they could be somebody that you know I'm doing a project with you know in a year or five years so I would say go into it with eyes wide open and every single day is an opportunity and because you play sports at a high level you're gonna have more opportunities than most you just gotta take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of view um, the role of media outlets in that? And then the second part being, um, I guess, your less conventional media outlets like Deadspin and breaking those types of stories with fans like AO and TV favors and all those types of things. Yeah, I think the media plays in a very important role. You know, it's just like, you know, in 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 our. Um, you know in our government system we have checks and balances you know media is a checks and check and balance now you have to be careful because you know with um, with, with tremendous I don't, I don't want to say power but opportunity to do this comes a tremendous responsibility I think in today's day and age we have too many irresponsible journalists and you know Deadspin they do some good work you know um, they do some really good work that Mante Teo story was incredibly well reported They've done a whole bunch of different things, whether it be on agents or um, investigative pieces that were very well done. But um, you know, then they're doing stuff. You know, Gawker, who you know owns um, Deadspin, is doing something on uh, you know Tim Gunther's brother. You know, and exposing him. Um, and uh, so you know, I think it's you know, I think it's in important, but 
um, I think now, especially with scandal, especially in college sports, uh, especially with like steroids, um, you, ha you have to advance the story. I mean, I think people have become hardened you know, just like you watch the news all the time and you see, you know, there's the, the old adage in, in television news, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, people get hardened to that. They get sick of that. How are you going to be different? You know, I mean, Miami was a, a great story. North Carolina, you know, their academic scandal, uh, a great story. But over time, people have heard that story before. Not to say you shouldn't do it, but you got to take it to the next level. Right. Who was behind it? How did it happen? What impact did it make? You know, in, in journalism, it's always the who, what, when, where, why. And so you take that, and sometimes you just have to dig deeper. And I think in today's day and age, where everything comes in these bite-sized sound bites, um, it's, you know, how can you deliver a story where people care? You know, because, you know, if, if it's not going to make an impact, I'm not going to do a story. I'm going to do a story because I believe in the story, not because... I want to expose corruption. I could go into a lot of college athletic programs and I could spend six months there and I could find stuff. Just, it's just a fact of the matter. But I'm not out there kind of wagging my finger looking to do that. I want to see, you know, like why are we doing the story? How does it impact people's lives? How can we, how can we change the conversation? You know, we, you know I'm not idealistic and trying to promote change and you know there's a lot wrong with sports and college sports there's a lot wrong with a lot of things it's not my job necessarily to um, to preach but you know if, if I can do a story if I can tell a story in a way that moves the conversation that's kind of my job as a good journalist to really move the conversation and make people think in a different way and um, you know if that causes Legislative, legislative uh, change or change uh, in the way people think or act, all the better. But it's our job, really, to tell stories that make a difference and, most importantly, make people think. Time for one more. If we, if, excuse me, if there is one. Yes, sir. I just want to. <laughs> I work at the administration, so I have mine is related to. So there was a story, there was a, um, a former Oklahoma State police officer that was um, convicted of uh, sexually assaulting women, a bunch of women, you know, would like pull them over and to get out of something, you know, a ticket or an arrest um, would, would then sexually assault them. Um, a terrible, terrible story. Um, the court records and the police reports are awful. Um, he was uh, a college football player at Eastern Michigan. And so SB Nation, which has all sorts of writers all over the country, they have different blogs and networks and so forth, um, huge organization. They did a story on who this guy was as a football player, what made him tick. And almost like this is a reason why he was kind of wired this way. It was incredibly tone deaf, um, just awful. They uh, SB Nation obviously apologized and scrubbed it through, you know, scrubbed it from their system. But like anything else, today you put something out on the, the internet, is there. You can find it. You can read it. Um, it's terrible. I mean, it's, it's, it's our worst nightmare. And I know Spencer Hall, the editorial director of SB Nation, and he felt awful about it. How did it actually happen? It was, the system didn't work. Whatever, I don't know what system they have, um, but it needs to be changed. Um, I would like to think that that would never happen um, at our organization, but you never can say never. I mean, we saw what happened with Rolling Stone and the University of Virginia. Um, we saw uh, what you know. We saw what happened with um, you know with Jason Blair at the New York Times when he just simply made up stories. Um, you know, uh, Glass at the New Republic. It happens, and it's. Terrible, and can we learn from it? It happened at Grantland, which was beloved, and they did a story about a year and a half ago called Dr. V's Putter. And um, it was about 
a, a, a scientist who invented this putter and was on infomercials, um, allegedly worked for the CIA, um, but she was transgender and changed the gender, and this story exposed or outed this person. Um, during the process of reporting the story, this person committed suicide. And the story still ran. I mean, it was a terrible, Bill Simmons had to write uh, a long apology. Um, ESPN changed their whole system. So this happens and it can happen. It's unfortunate and it, it shouldn't happen. Um, the, what, what disappoints me about this SB Nation uh, thing, the Daniel Holtzclaw thing, is they said in their note, their mea culpa, that several editors raised objections to it and it still made it through. Um, that is extremely troubling um, because, you know, and the same thing happened at Grantland. Um, they try to make a story work that probably should never have run. Um, and the, I think the moral of the story is if, you know, your gut tells you that there's something wrong, something stinks, it probably stinks. Um, and I think so many people, there's so much competition, um, you know, to get this story, to get this definitive story, to have this thing go viral, good or bad, um, that sometimes we lose sight of what we're trying to do journalistically. And, you know, I think there's so many different organizations, there's so many different blogs, and everybody, a lot of them, um, you know, try to say they're, they're journal, it's journalism, it's not. But unfortunately for, for us, we kind of all get looped in on that. And this, this is how we kind of kind of lose our trust with everybody. We have one more point. And what was the second part? Uh, how many are there today? Uh, we have about 80 um, correspondents. I'll answer the second part first. And again, this is just me. Like it's kind of like boots on the ground reporting. Like I, since I teach, I have some connections to let's just say a dozen schools from Syracuse to Northwestern, Missouri, Indiana, whatever. Um, but for all the rest, I reached out directly to the chairs of the journalism department and said, "This is what we're doing." Um, and I got a lot through there, and then a second call, we went through the athletic department, and sports information, ADs, we got some more. Then I got, um, I got our writers involved. Hey, you know, do you, do you know anybody um, through your travels? And these are all students. Um, so like anything else, it was just, it was kind of boots on the ground reporting, and let's find these people. It's gonna be easier in year two, but you know, I probably personally, because it was so important to me, like I made the initial contact, um, you know, to 60 some odd schools and, and had correspondence with, um, you know, with, with these people. But, you know, a lot of times it's just, like I, I said earlier, it's just sometimes you just have to ask. Sometimes you just have to look, you have to know what rock to turn over. You never know what you're going to find. And, and now we found like all these great gems. I thought maybe if we could find three or four future stars, I have at least two dozen future stars, you know, and, and I, now they're engaged with our brand and are reading Campus Rush and SI and MMQB and the magazine um, and are not just conditioned to go to ESPN or Bleacher or, uh, or anywhere else. You know, now they, they know who we are and, you know, they can tell their friends, you know, they can tell somebody else, they can uh, help us grow, you know, socially. So I think it's, you know, in the long term, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be huge for us. It's been great. Let's thank our guests.